Praise the Lord, everybody. Come on, stand up on your feet. Let's give God a praise on this morning. Amen. The reason why I can praise him on this morning, because all my life, he has been faithful. All my life, he has been good. Amen. Hallelujah. If you don't praise him, I got a reason to praise him. I have a right to praise him on this morning. I didn't wake myself up on this morning. If it had not been for the Lord, I will still be my stoop on this morning. So I came out this afternoon to give God the glory and give God the praise that he deserves. Hallelujah, hallelujah. When I think about what's going on in our, what's going on with those people over there in, in um, Ukraine, that right there is enough right there for me to start giving God some praise. It could have been us. Amen. But God, amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I woke up, I woke up with a praise on this morning. Amen. I come down the highway with a praise this morning. Amen. The Bible says, enter to his gate with thanksgiving. Enter to his God with praise and be thankful unto him and bless his name. Hallelujah. I don't know what you're grateful for, but I'm grateful to be alive on this morning. I'm thankful to be alive on this morning. I could have been in a hospital. I could have been in my grave, but God... Hallelujah. Come on, give God a praise in here this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You shouldn't have to be pumped up to praise God. Hallelujah. I shouldn't have to pump you up. Amen. Hallelujah. This is self-service on this morning. So if you want a blessing, you're going to have to praise him for it. You want a miracle, you're going to have to praise him for it. Hallelujah. 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 I'm just excited, amen, to be in the house one more time. Amen. To give God glory and give God honor and give God praise. Amen. I thank God for you, you and especially you. Amen. To press your way out on this morning. Yesterday morning it was snowing, it was ice and everything was going on. But guess what? I was prepared to come yesterday morning through all of that. Amen. Hallelujah. I knew I had to get to the house of God. Amen. Hallelujah. This is the hospital. Amen. I'd rather come to this hospital and to go to Hope's and Valley Hospital. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father God, again, we say thank you. You have kept us all week long. You have held back incidents. And you have held back accidents, God. You have blessed us beyond measure this morning, God. And we come to give you the glory, give you the honor, and give you the praise, God. I pray on this morning that you will open up the floodgates of heaven. Oh, God, let it rain on us this morning like never before, God. Let healing come in this house on the day. In the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you in advance, God, for the preach word on this morning. I pray that we come with power. Let it come with the anointing, God. In the mighty name of Jesus, bind us together this morning with chains that cannot be broken, God. Touch my sister, touch my brother. If anyone's sick in this house right now, God, send your word to heal in the name of Jesus. Go into the hospital, God. Go into the nursing home. Touch that mother, that father, that sister. Amen, that brother, God. Go to Ukraine right now, God. Touch those people, God, that suffer for no reason, God. In the mighty name of Jesus. God, we know that you're a healer, God. And we know that you can do anything but fail, God. So we thank you in advance, God, for what you're going to do through the song of this morning, God. In the mighty name of Jesus, God, have your way in this house, God, like never before, God. And we'll promise to give you the glory. We promise to give you the praise. In Jesus' name, thank God. Amen.
it, saints. Hallelujah. Shout Jesus from the mountain. Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family. I speak the holy name. Just touch somebody near you and look at them and just say Jesus. Speak Jesus over that person that you're beside of. Hallelujah, Lord. Oh, hallelujah. I'm so grateful for his name, saints. What would we do without his name? Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. If your mind is troubled this morning, just touch your mind and say, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. The Bible said he will keep them in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. Jesus. Lord, I speak Jesus over my mind. If your body is sick this morning, just touch your body and declare Jesus. Jesus over my body. Jesus over diabetes, Jesus over cancer, Jesus over heart failure, Jesus, I speak your name, Jesus, over sickness and disease, God, I speak your name, Jesus, I speak your name, if you're watching over live stream, just touch your body and say, Lord, I speak Jesus, I speak Jesus, the Bible said he sent his word to heal us, and his word is Jesus, I speak Jesus, Jesus, oh, I speak Jesus, hallelujah, hallelujah over my finances, I speak Jesus over my spouse, I speak Jesus over my home, I speak Jesus, oh, hallelujah, oh, over my children, I speak Jesus over my grandchildren. I speak Jesus over my business. I speak Jesus. Lord, I want everything about me to be covered, to be saturated. I want it, Lord God, to be overwhelmed by the name of Jesus. Oh, we speak Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus, 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 oh hallelujah, 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 oh I see.
presence of God to, can do every dark addiction every dark addiction has to be broken in the name of Jesus
The presence of the Lord is in this place.
Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Amen. Surely God is in this house. Bless this morning. No place I'd rather be this morning than in the presence of the Lord. of the Lord. There is fullness of joy. And at his right hand there are pleasures evermore. Amen. My God. I was disappointed that I didn't get to go to Florida, but I'm not disappointed this morning. Amen. So glad to be in this place. So glad to be in his presence. But we're going to receive our tithes, our offerings. We're going to minister to the Lord in, the, in our giving. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen, brother. The Lord loves a cheerful giver, doesn't he? Oh, thank you, God. Those of you that are watching online, feel free to join in with us. Amen. You can do it through Givelify. You can do it through Cash App. It should be up on your screen. You can mail in a check. Just went and picked up a tithe that somebody sent in just the other day via check. So I'm telling you, God's touching hearts of people all over the place. It's just, it's beyond me. Every time I go to the P.O. box, I just wonder, Lord, who are you going to touch this time? And uh, he's just doing amazing things. So don't want to forget our building fund. Um, I believe God's going to give us grace to pay that thing down real quick uh, so that we can, uh, so that we can just be free. The Bible says that the borrower is a servant to the lender. And I believe God wants his house free and his people free. And so just remember that in your extra giving beyond your tithes and your offerings. Again, Sister Shonda and I, we, we made a commitment to the Lord for $100 a month. And I'm telling you, saints, God has never failed us to meet every one of our needs according to his riches and glory. And uh, I know that he won't fail you. Man. What an awesome presence of God. I want to receive the offering, but I want to just keep worshiping. So we'll just keep worshiping as we give our offering. Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity to take, Lord, just a tenth of what you have blessed us so abundantly with. And to give it, Lord God, so that your house, Lord, might function in the ways that you have called it to, Lord. We thank you, God, for those that have the heart to give and those that have a joy to minister to you and giving for those of us that are struggling god to help us lord because lord and sometimes we believe but lord help our unbelief bless those that have to give today bless them abundantly as you watch over your word to perform it concerning them in jesus name amen and amen all right brothers come let's joyfully bring our tithes and our offerings before the lord Press. 
signs to magnify his name. And when we see his face, his glory fills this place as we worship the King. Glory to God. Worship the King. Worship the King. Lord, we are in his presence to magnify his name and when we see his face our glory fills this place as we worship the king will dismiss kids church hallelujah worship the king worship the king his presence to magnify his name and when we see his face his glory fills this place as we worship the king we worship the king we will worship the king cause we are in his presence to magnify his name and when we see his face his glory fills this place as we worship the king one more time we will worship the king we worship the king presence to magnify his name and when we see his face come on, go. as we worship the king oh we're gonna worship the king oh worship the king To magnify his name And when we seek his face His glory fills this place As we worship the King Grab your Bibles, turn to Romans 8 Worship the King Worship the King Good God We are in his presence and we'll name. Oh, and when we see His face, oh, His glory fills His place as we worship the King. Romans 8, verse 31 says, What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not His own Son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God. Who also maketh intercession for us. My God. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Glory to God. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord God Almighty. I just want to preach to you this, morning, this afternoon, rather, from this subject, nothing means nothing. 
Nothing means nothing. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you so much for your presence that we have felt in this place, for the anointing that we have experienced all over this house. I thank you for the breakthroughs that took place this morning. As we exalted your name, Lord, because, Lord, we're starting to understand that it's your name that's going to make all the difference in all of the world. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that you would now have your way as we break the bread of your word, God. That you would speak to our hearts and our minds, God. Speak clearly, O oh God. And Lord, give us a word that we can hold on to this week. That will carry us, Lord, even until we come back again. And for it, we will give you praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. While you're on your way to your seat, would you just look at somebody and tell them, nothing means nothing. Nothing means nothing. Amen. Praise God. This is a wonderful day to be in the house of God. I prayed. I said, God, when I woke up yesterday morning and saw that snow on the ground, I said, dear Lord, get rid of it. Because I don't want snow to stop us from having church. Because I need this place, saints. I'm finding out more and more how powerful the local church is in my life and how much I really do need it. I need the strength. I need the comfort, the encouragement, the friendship. I need the camaraderie. There's just something about the body of Christ that cannot be duplicated anywhere else in our lives. And so I thank God for this house. I thank God for you all. Thank God for, these, for, for the fellowship of the body of Christ. And I thank God that he's helping us to understand what he's doing right now. Um, I just want to be in the present move of God. And I don't have to, you know, it doesn't have to look like I thought it would look or it doesn't have to be what I thought it would be. Um, I think we all come with these predisposed ideas of how God's going to do everything. And then God shows up and blows your mind and says, wait a minute, why don't you just let me do it the way I want to do it? And I say, nevertheless, good is the will of the Lord. Because his will is the safest place. It is the most, it is the most protected place you can be is in the will of God. doesn't mean that you're not going to suffer setbacks. doesn't mean that you're not going to suffer some type of difficulties in your life. But I'd rather be in the middle of the will of God, having God present in my life struggling, than to be struggling outside of the will of God and have absolutely no help at all. Amen. And so we thank God for his presence and his anointing. I, I, was, I was just pondering this through this week. And saints of God, we're headed into times as we've talked about, that is going to be difficult for the church. I'm not going to stand up here and promise you any fairy tale. Um, God's pulling back a lot of carpet right now and exposing a lot of ugly in the church, and I thank God for every bit of it. It doesn't feel good. and Boy, it's smearing some of my historical narrative, but that's all right. That's all right. It can't be healed unless it's revealed, and it can't be corrected unless God pulls back the carpet. And so my prayer is that God will pull back the carpet on everything. And it will be exposed for what it is, and we'll all just get up and go on with Jesus, all right? Uh, and we pray for those who have been dealt with uh, in, in the manner of, of having to be the victims, to fall prey to some of this stuff. But God can heal every bit of that, saints. I am a, I am a firm believer, and I am a, uh, a man with an experience that knows that God can heal the most utter devastation in your life. Um, and so we'll pray for those that have been harmed. But thank God that we're on the other side headed on. Amen. I, I, sometimes I wonder, God, why won't you let me do what I want to do? Why won't you let me have it the way I want to have it? Why don't you let me be a part of what is most comfortable for me? But then the Lord starts pulling back the blanket and starts pulling back the carpet, and you start going, thank you, Lord, for just letting me go on. Thank you, God, for letting me be where I am. And as I was thinking about this, judgment is going to begin in the house of God. Um, it's got to. It's the word of God. It's got to come to us first. Before it can ever happen to the world, judgment must begin here. And so I'm praying that God will reveal to me anything in my life that I need to get right, that I need to, 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 uh, that I need to give to the Lord so that the Lord can make whole, so that the Lord can heal. Because saints of God, I don't want to be another generation of hypocrisy. Amen. I don't want, I don't want my generation of ministry uh, to be the, the thing that causes other people to not want to serve God or to, to fall away from the Lord. I don't want that. I want, I want a situation where when people look at our generation of ministry, they will say, thank God we had some brothers that just did this right. Thank God we had some men that loved the people. For the Bible says that you have had many teachers but few fathers. And I'm praying that God will give us a situation where there will be fathers in the house of God that won't prey on the people while they're praying for the people. 
Amen. I really do want that. That's my heart's desire. And I believe God's doing that. I, I know men all over the country right now that God's turning and pushing and, and moving away from things that would be destructive to God's people. And I thank God for those men who are willing to do so because it's easy to stay in your comfort zone. Oh, man, it's easy to stay right where you know how to do everything. But then God pulls you into a season and says, you know what? You're going to have to trust me for your next step. You're going to have to just trust me. I, I, you're not going to know where I'm going to put it. But know that the steps of good men are ordered of the Lord. So if you'll just pick it up, I'll set it down where it belongs. And so I'm having to learn a whole different way of doing things. But it's the word of God's way. And, and that's the best way. And so we're thinking about, I was thinking about that, you know, so many people having suffered. I was also considering the condition that we're in, uh, in the world, as it pertains to war and rumors of wars, and also as the condition as it pertains to us as, 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 as 21st century citizens of a country that is imploding on itself. I mean, this is where we're at, saints of God. And when you think about it, uh, I was listening to Brother Rativi talk yesterday while he was in Florida, and he was talking about the fact that in 2019, he, he was in Ukraine, ministering in Ukraine. And he said that there was so much trouble from Ukraine and, and, and through Russia. They were having to cross borders constantly because they were preaching the gospel. Can you imagine that in the 21st century that we're still living in a place where it is, it is a lethal thing for you to preach the gospel in some countries that we consider civilized? These aren't third world countries. These are the first world countries. But it's still illegal to preach the gospel. And if you don't think that's coming to our shores, you're just fooling yourself. For the Bible said, Jesus said in Matthew 24, you shall be hated of all nations. How many is all? It's everybody. We're going to be hated of all nations. But he said, bless are you when men shall persecute you and revile you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake, for great is your reward in heaven. And so I want you to be prepared for that because hostility toward Christianity is at an all-time high in this country. It really is. Hostility toward Christianity is horrible. And I'm going to tell you, to some degree, Christianity has made its bed. With the mess that we have put uh, out there, we've made our bed in some of these things. And the world doesn't hate us because of Jesus. Sometimes the world hates us because we refuse to exercise self-control over the flesh. And so they look at us and say, my God, you can't control yourself. Why would I serve a God who can't even help you get control of you? And so a lot of, a lot of the hatred, that's the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm just pleading men that will watch this and you ministers in here that will minister before God, please watch what you do. Amen. Let me tell you something. We can think we can do things in secret and nobody will ever know. But God sees all things. And the Bible said everything done in darkness shall be revealed by light. And I know some guys right now that a whole lot of light shining on them. And it's revealing some really ugly things, some awful things, some wicked things. And don't think that God is any respecter of persons. God's not going to look past their stuff. Not, God's not going to put the, 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 the lamp on their stuff and then look past mine. Amen. We have got to deal with ourselves. Good Lord in heaven. Until God's people are safe in the house of God. Amen. Praise God. And that's the reason why, you know, Chandra and I were talking the other day. And I said, you know, Sean, I said, I'd rather be a little bit on the other side of God's people being free around me. As opposed to be on the other side of God's people being terrified around me. Doing anything I told them to do without question. That's a horrible thing. For any, that is a horrible place for any minister to get to because we are not infallible deities. We are men of like passions, and there is no temptation that can overtake any of us but such as common to man. And so I'd rather be in the place of accountability than in the place of infallibility because that is where you fall. Amen. And so I, I'm pleading. I really, man, the more I hear this stuff and the more I read and see stuff, I think, my God, do you not know who you're dealing with? You all are precious to God. Jesus gave his life for you. He shed his blood on Calvary for you. For me, yes, but he did it for you. And all he did was set men of God in the earth as watchmen. That's all. That's all not as lords over God's heritage. We're not royalty. We're not kings up here to laud our authority over God's heritage. Yes, reprove, rebuke, exhort. 
all of that stuff. I agree with every bit of that. But as a father, not as a king. There's a whole lot of different way. Listen, what, I think one of the most dangerous things that can happen to any minister is to not ever have children. I, I, and I hear what Paul says, be as me, blah, blah, blah. I get that. That was his own personal opinion. He said, I speak as a man. But ministers need to have children because children help you to understand how you are to treat God's people. They help you to understand that you can't uniform everybody. Because everybody's not like everybody. We're all individuals. Amen. You can't, you can't do for one and, and do the same thing for the other because they all react differently. Listen, I've, I've helped my wife raise four children. And our four children are so unique. They're so different. And, and you can't deal with any of those children the same way. Every one of them have a way for you to deal with them that will, that will touch them in a different way than the, other person, than the other one will be dealt with. And so that helps. It also helps for patience. Good God in heaven, I, I do not expect immediate perfection out of this sanctuary. You're going to struggle through some things. We're growing in grace. And we grow by, from faith to faith, from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of God, which means that there are times we are going to fall down. But a just man falls down seven times, he gets back up again. It's not, listen, what, what justifies you is not that you never fall. It's that you never stay down. You get yourself back up again. So when you find yourself in a place of failure, my God, don't sit there and roll in it. Get yourself back up again. Amen. And if you got to come down and throw some things down on the altar and say, I'm done with it, then do that. This is a safe place. Ain't nobody going to sit there and look at you like something's wrong with you. Come on, son. I have seen men treat men so harshly and horribly. Now, I'm not talking about total reprobates and apostates. I'm not talking about that. False doctrine is damnable, and we'll, we'll, we deal with that stuff. But the fact of the matter is I've seen men with horrible, terrible behavior, I mean awful character, stand there hypocritically and put on costumes and act on stage one way, and then God shined the light on their behavior, and it's heinous. It's horrible. I mean, it's vile. And then you sit there and think about how they treat other people and say, my God in heaven. Who art thou, old man, who judgest another when thou doest the same thing or worse? And so I, when Sister Shonda came and brought that up here, my heart rejoiced. I didn't sit there and think, what in the world is right? No, my heart rejoiced. That's another child of God that says, Lord, I'm going to trust you with something that I've never trusted you with before. And I believe, Sister Shonda, that today was your day for God to deliver you, and you're going to leave free, and you're going to live free. Because there's got to be mercy in this house. There's got to be grace in this house. Because we are living in a harsh world. We are living in a harsh world. And so I was reading this text, and I've read this so many times, and I've probably preached from it more times than I can count. But it's so powerful. It is so powerful. When you really begin to understand, because when you're reading Scripture, you can't just read. I know I just read a few verses, but the few verses really don't tell the whole story. I just read that text for some context. But then you got to really start painting the picture here because Romans 7 is Paul's declaration of his absolute depraved state when he was in a situation where, um, where he, was, he was without the law, he was sinning, he was completely and utterly and without fail sinning, but he didn't know it was sin. He said, I had not known sin, save the law said thou shalt not covet. He said, my goodness gracious. He said, he said, here I was alive. He said, but then the law came and sin revived and I died. And he tells us in Romans 7 as he's walking us through the steps of him coming to the knowledge of his sin and eventually coming to the knowledge of his Savior. He's sitting here talking about the more I read the law, the more sinful I realized I was. He said, I mean, sin was just absolutely enveloping me. But he goes down to the, toward the end of Romans 7 and he said, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? He's saying, listen, I don't have no hope. This thing is over for me. But then he said, oh, I thank God through Jesus Christ. Oh, I thank God. I thank God that I found a Savior. And so he ends the seventh chapter 
with finding his Savior. Then he goes into the 8th chapter filled with the Holy Ghost. And he starts talking about if you got the Holy Ghost in you, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Because the law of the spirit of life hath made me free from the law of sin and death. There's power in me now. I'm no longer walking according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And I am no longer in bondage to my flesh. I am now free to serve God. And he's walking us through this incredible story of his. And then he begins to talk to us about the fact that we're children of God. That if the spirit of God dwells in us, we're his children. Somebody say, I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. You need to remind yourself every once in a while. Because there's sometimes you and I can get in such a state where we don't feel like it. But it's not about what we feel, it's about what we know. And I keep telling you, saints, and I've told you that for years, we don't worship God on how we feel. We worship God on what we know in spite of what we feel. So I don't have to come in and feel anything. I just worship him because I know that he's good and he's been gracious to me and he's kept me. So he reminds us, we're the children of God. He reminds us of that. He also reminds us that there is hope of glory. That what holds on to us is not necessarily our present situation. Because I'm going to tell you, saints, the more time goes on, the more trouble is coming. So if you are, if you're determining the love of God towards you, based upon what you're going through in the immediate, you're probably going to lose all hope. But we have to keep our eyes fixated on the coming of Jesus Christ and the establishment of the theocratic government of God on the earth. That's the only hope we got. Listen, if Jesus doesn't come back, we are done for. Paul said, if there be no resurrection, he said, I'm of all men most miserable. He said, let's eat, let's drink. Tomorrow we die. This means absolutely nothing. But I do not believe that Jesus is a liar. I believe that when he said, if I go away, I will come again. That's exactly what he intends to do. And so we have to remember that because things are going to get more difficult financially, economically. Things are going to get very difficult. In some places in our country, they're paying over $7 a gallon for gas right now. Now, that may not seem a lot to you, but when you think about all of these trucks out there paying over $1,000 per tank to fuel up their, 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 their tractor trailers so that the stuff that you and I buy from the stores can get to the stores, and then the stores have to begin to mitigate their prices concerning the price of transportation to get there. Listen, saints of God, you better start understanding grocery bills are about to go through the roof. You say, Pastor, this is bleak. You're talking bleak news. I'm not really. I'm not because David said, I have been young and I am now old. I ain't never seen the righteous forsaken nor a seed begging bread. But we have to know that these times are coming. We have to understand, children of God, that we're going to be hated of all nations, of all men. Men are going to speak evil of us. People are going to be hostile toward us. And you have to understand that when the enemy, and, and it could be that Satan has already had his final, you get out of here and don't you ever come back. Because the Bible said when he's cast out that final time, he comes down knowing that his time is short and he comes down with great wrath. And he begins to persecute the church. And he comes down as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And he's not looking to eat up this world. He's already got them. He's seeking to devour us. He's seeking to devour you and I. And that's the reason why you don't need to get caught up in stuff. This is not about things, and this is not about circumstances. This is about your soul. The enemy doesn't care about your things, and he doesn't care about your circumstances. But if he can use things and circumstances to eat your soul, that's exactly what he's going to do. So you have to be sober, and you have to be vigilant. You and I can no longer afford to be drunk. We can't afford to be on, intoxicated upon the pleasures of this world. We can't afford to any longer be intoxicated upon high emotional activities. You and I are going to have to get sober. And I'm not talking about in worship. We'll get free and dance and shout, speak in tongues, and praise God, and fall out and cry and do every bit of that. None of that's going to change. But when it comes to your mental state, you and I are going to have to really sober up really fast. 
And I don't believe that this is the last time we're going to see people take pill bottles and throw them at the altar because God's going to start healing our minds. He's going to start regulating our thoughts. He's going to help us get power and, and so that every thought and every imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, we are going to finally realize we have the power to get that stuff underneath the blood of Jesus Christ and to bring it into captivity to obedience. So we have to understand these things. And I, I, I want to get you prepared in your mind because if we don't get prepared up here, saints of God, we're going to lose our minds. We're going to go crazy. So, so all of us that are drunk on stuff, we're, 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 we're very possession-oriented people. Look at somebody near you and tell them, get right on over it. Just get over it. Get over it. Your possessions are going to mean nothing here shortly. Nothing. That's the reason why Jesus looked at his disciples and said, a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things that, that he possesses. Now, Jesus wasn't trying to say, I want all of y'all to be poor and live in caves. That's not what he's saying. He understood the persecution that was coming from a tyrannical ruler in Rome that was going to be heaped upon the church, and he knew where they would be. So he said, look, all of you that think that your life is about stuff, stop thinking like that because eventually we're going to have to have all the rich people sell their stuff in the church so that you can eat so what if you have a lot of expensive things and God says go sell that so the church can eat but your mind is caught up in it's all this stuff that gives me value you'll hold on to your stuff and let people starve I want to get you ready. This is where we're headed. What's going to happen when people lose their homes? You're going to have to take them in so that we don't have churches full of homeless people. God forbid that the Lord would let me hold on to my home while another loses theirs, and I'm satisfied with them going down and sleeping at the Salvation Army when I could have taken care of them. So the Bible said in the first century, no man thought his own possessions as his own. We're going to take them in. Take care of them. Make sure that they're not homeless. Amen. Praise God. Nobody was shouting over that at all. <laughs> he also acknowledges the sovereign hand of God in our lives. And I want to read that. He said uh, in verse 28 of Romans 8, he said, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. And how does this happen? Because in verse 26, it says, likewise, the spirit help also helpeth our infirmities for when we know uh, not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings or with words that are illegal to be understood, groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. That's the reason why we need the Holy Ghost to be really active in the church. And you need the Holy Ghost to be really active in your life. Do not quench the Spirit of God. And don't ever think for a moment that we are smart enough and intelligent enough and brilliant enough that we can make determinations and decisions that are wiser than those determinations and decisions that the Spirit of God can make for us. But they that are led of the Spirit of God, they are the, there you go. So we're really going to need the Spirit of God to be active in our lives. And so he says here that all things work together for our good. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate, in verse 29, to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, whom he called, he justified, and them he justified, he also glorified. God is sovereignly involved in your life. You know, most of the time, God's doing things for us we will never see. There are times God's protecting us, and we never know it. There are times that God is making a way for us and we don't even know it. There are times that God's giving favor to us and we don't even realize it. 
God is involved in your life, and you're going to have to get that deeply in your heart. I don't care if it doesn't feel like it right now. It's not about feelings right now. It's about revelation and knowledge and understanding from the Word of God, and you have to know that no matter what you're going through, no matter what situation you find yourself in, God's there and he's involved. You may not see it right now, but he's involved. He is working this out for your good. At the end of this, it has to benefit you is what I'm telling you. Amen. And so sometimes I believe that maybe even Satan is, to de is deceived to believe that he just has uh, unfettered access to us. And maybe sometimes we believe that the enemy has unfettered access to us. And we think God's just turned him loose. And he's just doing whatever he wants to us without any type of repercussion. But you've got to understand, children of God, that the enemy is also being used by God for you. I told the church one time, I said, the, I said, Satan is an unwitting participant in your perfection. He doesn't realize that God's using him to perfect that thing that is concerning you. He doesn't realize that God's using him to show that God is stronger, to show that God is wiser, to show that God is merciful and graceful. He doesn't even understand that he's opening doors for you to see the divine nature of God in arenas you would have never seen had he not attacked you. And so if you're under the attack of the enemy right now, start looking for the Lord in it because God just doesn't let him have free reign over your life. He's sovereignly involved. He knows you. He's predestined you. And because he's predestined you, he's conforming you. This is who he is. He's that sovereignly, intimately involved in your life. And you've got to believe that with all of your heart. And so that sovereign involvement allows us to understand that no one can bring a charge against God's children that would deceive the Lord. That's a powerful statement right there. If God sees everything, and if all things are open and naked before him whom we have to do, and if there is nothing that is unexposed or hidden from his sight, you have to know that every person that comes against you to falsely charge you before the Lord, they cannot deceive God. Hallelujah. I don't care who's gossiping about you. I don't care who's tearing you down. I don't care who's trying to get you to believe yourself that God has forsaken you. There is nobody that is smart enough and wise enough or wily enough that they have the ability to deceive God concerning you. So let them talk. Let them gossip. You are a child of God. Lift your head up, bow your back, and serve God. Don't you ever allow lies to discourage you. Don't you ever allow gossip to dissettle you. You're a child of God. Have you ever just sat around and the enemy start charging you? I mean, just wear you out. And I love it because he can't use your future. And he knows no more about your present than you do. And so what does he use? He uses your past. He comes up and just starts charging you. For all the things that you've done wrong and all the sin that you committed and all of that. So don't you understand that's his exercise in discouragement? And oftentimes it's because there's something about you that really is causing him to fear what you might become in the future. And so he has to stop you in the present by using your past. Because he's really terrified for you to walk with God into your future. He don't mind for you to live. He just doesn't want you walking with God. And so he'll get you into a place of accusation to where you will stop walking with God because you'll think, how could God ever love somebody that has done the things that I've done and been the places that I've been and, 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 and have said the things that I've said? And how could God love someone like me? But you've got to understand, children of God, he saved you like you were. 
the Bible said that God commended his love toward us. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so when the enemy comes to take your past, to accuse you, to try to get you discouraged so that you stop walking with the Lord, just turn back at him and say, he already knows and that's why he died. I'm washed. I'm cleansed. I'm sanctified. I've been forgiven. Not only does he know it, but I've told him all about it. You've got to get that in your spirit. So even when the enemy starts lying, and you have to understand, if the enemy ever really starts talking to you, you can't believe a thing that's coming out of his mouth. I don't even care if it sounds true. He will always use half-truths to try to get you to believe he's telling the truth. But you've got to look at him like Jesus did and say, you're a father of lies, and you've been a liar from the beginning. If God's got a message for me, I'll just hear what the Lord has to say to the church but as for me and you our conversations are immediately going to stop and I'm going to hear what the spirit has to say well how do I know it's the devil because anything that God has forgave, forgiven you from he has forgotten he's thrown it behind his back and he's cast it as far from him as the east is from the west and if you go East, you'll never, ever go west. In fact, the only way for you to go west if you're going east is for you to go back. Look at your neighbor, tell them, stop, stop chasing your past. Jesus said there is no man having put his shoulder to the plow and looking back that is fit for the kingdom of God. Stop chasing your past. Oh, hallelujah. That's the reason why I can't stand to get around people that can only glory in the past. You ever get around those people? Man, you remember back in high school? You remember, I'm 40 years old, dude. Are you kidding me? No, I don't remember back in high school. I'm hoping to forget a lot of what I do. <laughs> Hallelujah. I've been forgiven. I'm not going back there. But there are some people that can't quit chasing their past. They're always turning around to take a look at their past. The enemy's always got them in a place where they're constantly looking over their shoulder. But the Bible said looking unto Jesus, you can't... The la one of the people that turned to look back, God turned them into a pillar of salt. He stopped their journey right there because they kept looking back at what he was trying to get them to leave. I'm going to say that again because you need to get that deep in your spirit. Lot's wife was turned into salt because she looked back at what God was trying to get her to leave. And I want to challenge some people here maybe that are watching over live stream. If God is moving on, leave. My God, don't keep... Well, I have this heritage, and I know this person, and I come from this, and this person prayed for me, and I watched this person preach and all that. Leave. Thank God for every person that God used to help you. What, what if, what if, oh, Moses says, we're going over and to the promised land now, children. And they said, yeah. But it was back there at the Red Sea we saw God part the water. Man, right here in the middle of this wilderness, he fed us with manna from heaven. Quells when we got finished complaining about the manna, by the way, that didn't make us sick and didn't any of us grow old. In fact, our shoes didn't even wear out. But, but we didn't want that because we needed some meat. Come on, somebody. What if, what if they would have just gloried? in the manifestation of God's power while they were in the wilderness that they could not follow God to the brink of the promised land. And saints of God, I am praying. I know that the promised land is the kingdom. I realize that. So I'm asking God, don't let me get bogged down on the other side of the Red Sea because I watched you part some water. I want to go into the promised land. I want to go where it flows with milk and honey. I want to go where you are, Lord. I'm going to say this. Nostalgia never, ever is proof of a move of God. If that would have been the case, then we never would have left Mount Sinai. We'd be making a trek every year to Mount Sinai because that's where God gave Moses the law. 
If that were the case, the disciples would have never left the upper room. Oh, come on, somebody. But the Lord just keeps on moving. We can't get nostalgic. Listen, most people build mansions where God only asks them to have a memorial. They want to go back and live in what God only wanted them to remember. Moses would, or, or not Moses, but Abraham would pass an area and God would do something powerful and he'd set up an altar there. He'd set up a memorial. Jehovah Jireh, here God provided. But Moses just kept walking with God. He'd always remember Jehovah Jireh. But God called him to Canaan. And he couldn't go to Canaan as long as he was still stuck in Jehovah Jireh. Hallelujah. Saints, we got to move on. And we got to quit grieving over the past. And we got to quit mourning over things that have failed. And we got to quit hoping that things will somehow turn around. I'm just following Jesus now, okay? That's all I care about. That's all I want because I have to make it on the other side of this Jordan. And I'm never going to do it as long as I stay at Jehovah Jireh. Come on, somebody. I fondly remember the day that the Lord filled me with the Holy Ghost. But I can't go back to that place. And every time I want to feel God, I can't stand in that, that sanctuary at that place where I was filled with the Holy Ghost. I have found that God is not stationary to places, but he dwells in our praises. Good job. Woo, hallelujah. So I know you met God somewhere, but if God has moved you on, the child of God don't think that God has stayed there and asked you to leave. He is with you. He will never leave you, nor forsake you. And if you need his presence, you don't have to go back to that place. You just have to begin to give him praise. Hallelujah. I love meetings, and I go to some of them and that, that the Lord will allow me, and I appreciate them. But I never go to them with the expectation of experiencing something there that I cannot experience here. You want to know why? Because the same people praising him there are praising him here. And all we got to do is praise him. And we will feel his presence and his power will be here to heal and to deliver. Oh, God, hallelujah, glory to God. Because it's not about places. It's about praises. Uh, you can write that one down, hallelujah. That was free, glory to God. We have to quit looking back at the past. Even our wicked past. You look back, you can die there. And there are a lot of people that I know that would be rather turned into a pillar of salt than to go where God's taking them. Because they can't fathom in their mind that anything outside of the box that men have created for him, God is able to move in. But as you saw here today, I'm just going to tell you, if you came from my past, some of y'all wouldn't even be welcome in the building because of the way you're dressed. Reality. So forget deliverance. You'd have to go change your clothes before you could get free. Amen. Pictures up in the bathrooms. Amen. You, you look like this or go get changed. This is not God's will. That is man's. The Bible said when they teach for commandments, the traditions of men, those traditions of men become the doctrines of devils it becomes the very thing that the enemy uses to oppress the people of God and I believe in modesty and all of that stuff and you all know I do and I preach that hard here but the fact of the matter is traditions cannot become commandments hallelujah glory to God so that when God begins to move we say Lord no you we built this box for you and you can't <laughs> Go down to that church down there and touch people down there. No, you can't do that. You have to do it right here. How dare you? What is wrong with you? We almost get offended if we see God touching people outside of the box that we have built for him. Oh, I'm probably going to get some hate mail over this. But that's all right. I'm okay. Because I want to go on, saints. Listen, we are in a really powerful move of God right now. 
And I want to keep moving in that. So I want you to stop looking back at your past. Now listen, there are people in your past that the enemy uses to pull you in to behaviors that God has delivered you from. Okay? The Bible said if you allow that to happen, you're like a dog returning to its vomit. How many of y'all have ever had an animal throw up and you've watched the dog go back and eat it? How'd you feel about that? All of a sudden, you're starting to, ooh, Lord, ooh, Lord, gee, oh, I can't believe I just saw that. God said, that's exactly what I see. When I see you return back to your sin, that is exactly what I see. A dog returning to eat its own vomit. Or a sow that has been washed clean back to her wallowing in the mire. The enemy will always keep people in our life that we feel obligated to because somewhere in our life they were really there for us. I'm going to help you. We're we're dealing with the text here because I'm going to help you because all of these things that the Lord mentions through Paul in Romans 8 are outside of your control. These things that he will not allow to separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus is things that you can't control. But Jude later on says, keep yourself in the love of God, looking for that blessed hope. So if, is Paul and Jude contradicting each other? No. Paul's saying nothing outside of your control will God allow to separate you from his love. But Jude said the things you can control, you better keep them from causing you to walk away from his love. And so the enemy brings people into your life that were there for you, and, I, and, 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 and they were there for I don't know what I would have done without them. And you know what? They'll always bring up to you how they were there for you. When it's time for you to say, y'all, I got to go on now. Because if I stay around you, I keep doing things that I know I'm not supposed to do because... You are now no longer a blessing to me. You are a liability. And you're an assignment from the enemy to destroy me so that I do not move on with God. There are sometimes you have to operate the gift of goodbye to people who are, I don't care how well they've been for you in the past. Oh, man, I'd have been told, I'd been homeless, hungry. I mean, I don't know what I would have done. They were there for me when nobody else is there. But now that you're in the body of Christ, the dynamic has changed. You are no longer alone. You may have needed them in the world, but if they're constantly going to draw you into iniquity, you don't need them anymore. And you got to get that in your spirit. I'm not fornicating. I'm not committing adultery. I'm abstaining from every appearance of sin. There ain't no way. I'm not going back to pills, partying, the bottle. Ain't none of that going to happen. And if all you can do in my life is be the tug of war to pull me back into a place that God has delivered me from, see you later. I got to go on and serve the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We have to get this in our spirit, saints of God, because there are too many of us as children of God letting things in our control continue to uh, cause us to stumble when all we have to do is just get it out. Jesus said, if your right hand offends you, then cut that thing off. If your right eye offends you, pluck it out. If you have the power to dismiss it from your life, get it out of your life and don't wait till tomorrow. Don't wait till next week, not next month, but by the time you get home, cut it out. Amen. Ain't nobody gonna love you. I was the only one crazy enough to like you. See ya. Amen. You know at your age, ain't nobody going to come around later. Come on, I'll just trust myself with the Lord and every good thing I need in my life, God is great enough to add it to me because the blessing of the Lord maketh rich and added no sorrow to it.
Because if it's separating me from God's love, I got to let it go. Ah, oh, glory to God. But how do you know? Because if it's, if it's adjuring me to break God's commandments, then it is assignment of the enemy. If it is pressing me to compromise my life so that I'm no longer walking in holiness. Saints, I'm over all this. No facial hair. Do your hair a certain way. You know, now, nah, please, I would that you would wear a skirt a certain length. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying, all right? No mini skirts up in the house of God, all right? Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. And a mini skirt with leggings is still a mini skirt. <laughs> Glory to God. Amen. I think some women think if I wear leggings, ain't nobody going to know what I got. <laughs> Honey, they were made to let everybody know what you have. <laughs> All right, so when you're offering it up on the table, praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Then you may very well cause somebody to stumble. So I, I'm, I'm all about modesty. I'm not talking about that. But at the same time, I know what it feels like to put it on but never allow it to come in. I know what it feels like to dress it up but never let it be cleaned up. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I have watched some of the most professional, holy, profound-looking people on planet Earth commit some of the most heinous actions that is imaginable unto man. And it makes you realize, God, if you don't get on my, in my heart, I don't care. I don't care if I wear a $1,500 suit or a $5 pair of pants from Walmart. If you don't get in my heart, <laughs> Hallelujah. I don't want you on me, Jesus. I want you to get in me, Lord. Get in my heart. Because I can't let this stuff keep me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. I can't let people be the avenue that not only causes compromise in my life, but compromise in my children's life. Listen, our children see things, and they're aware of things. And if you're committing activity that is either sinful or it looks evil, you are perverting their spirit toward God and putting compromise in their life. And, and we can't get mad at them when they're disobedient when we're disobedient. If we show disobedience toward the authority of God in our life, how are you going to get mad when they disobey you? Yeah. So God, let holiness be in my heart. Let holy, and, and let me tell you something. Something on the inside will work on the outside. It will. And it will bring holiness to how I present myself. But not according to the tradition of men. Mm -mm. That's a doctrine of the devil. We're going to get those doctrines out. We're going to live a holy life in our heart so that men might not see our good dress. I've had, I've had ladies in holiness garb look at me after going to a karaoke bar and singing while they're in their long skirts and say, well, we had our long skirts on. They knew we loved Jesus. While you was in there singing all kind of filth and all kind of nastiness, but you had your long skirts on because they knew you loved Jesus because of the way you looked. That is exactly the kind of compromise that that kind of doctrine puts in our life. We think if we dress it up, it doesn't matter what we do as long as we look the part. God, I just want to be the part because I want them to see my good works, not my good dress or my good words, but Lord, let them see my good works and glorify my Father which is in heaven, good God in heaven. And so the Paul here, we've dealt with all these things that we can control, right? Our behavior, our character, our conversation. All these things are things we can control. But there are things outside of our control that come against us. And these are the areas really, because if you're honest with yourself, you're not real tore up about the stuff you can control. And it's because we deflect in our life and we're always worried about what everybody else does to us. Not really what we're doing, but what they're doing to us. Oh, no amens? <laughs> I thought y'all would really get excited about that statement. I, mean, I think I may even have it highlighted in red, like this is going to be a banner moment in this message. 
<laughs> I am just playing. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, is it's easier to deflect, to look at what everybody else is doing to us instead of looking at what we are doing ourselves. But their behavior won't put me in the lake of fire. It will be my behavior, my care. It won't be their character. It won't be their slander. It won't be their gossip. It won't be any of their actions. It will be me. And so Paul deals with us here, and he's talking about it. He said, what shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? And he makes this incredible statement here. He said, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? He said, if he has already went to the extent that he'd kill his own son for you, what is it that he will not give to you that you need to serve him? My God in heaven. What a statement. What a revelation, what an understanding. If he already did what was most difficult, what is this in your life that God will not get you through? What is this in your life that God will not deliver you from? He spared not his own son, but he delivered him up for us. How shall he not also with him freely give us all things? Good God in heaven. The Bible said he will give to us all things concerning life and godliness. He said, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God who maketh intercession. Listen, this is so powerful, God. He's praying for me. I can't listen. If that doesn't excite you, it excites me. That he's praying for me, saints. He's praying for me. Can you imagine that he's praying for us? He's making intercession for the saints. And my God, when the enemy starts to come in, the Lord starts praying for the church. I'm so thankful that Jared's strength has not been what God has depended upon to keep this church afloat. I am so grateful that when the enemy has come in to destroy it, I believe that Jesus has started praying for us. Because I wasn't wise enough to keep us. I wasn't wise enough to help us. I wasn't smart enough to see this thing get through. But oh God, woo, somebody was praying for me. We used to sing my, when I was young, somebody touched heaven for me. Somebody touched heaven for me. And with a touch from above, he filled me with love. And I know Jesus touched heaven for me. Is there anybody in here glad that Jesus touched heaven for you? That when you were in a crisis, and I'm talking about in the middle of the night, when you couldn't get a hold of the pastor when you couldn't get a hold of your mom or your dad when you couldn't get a hold of your sister or brother I believe that Jesus started praying for you I believe that Jesus started making intercession for you somebody touched heaven for me and so he says who first he says what then he says who this is very important because you have to understand who is not what and what is not who. He says, there are things that won't separate you from me, and I will not let people separate you from me. Because the enemy uses things and people. It's always stuff and people. You have to understand that God has created some guardrails there for you so that you will not go off the side of the cliff when the enemy is trying to take you out, when he's sending the wrong people or he's trying to mess with things. God's got some guardrails in the word of God that keeps you from going off the edge. Could God in heaven. So he says, what? And then he says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Now he's dealing with circumstance. He says, shall tribulation and tribulation is trouble that is brought to you by an unbelieving world. So what happens when people start to persecute you? When they start talking about you? 
When people really start bringing trouble to us, and I'm talking about heavy persecution. I'm not talking because they disliked your picture on Facebook or they put a mad emoji on, on your post. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about real, serious, significant persecution. If we don't understand Romans 8, it will destroy us. Shall tribulation, trouble that is brought to us by an unbelieving world, shall that separate us from the love of God? Does that mean if God allows tribulation to come in my life that God doesn't love me? When Jesus said in this world, you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. <laughs> I have overcome the world. <laughs> Glory to God. He said, or distress or persecution, imprisonment, martyrdom for our faith. What if we start seeing family members thrown into prison? What if we start seeing family members put to death because they confess the name of the Lord? Will you let that cause you to believe that God is no longer real or he's indifferent or he doesn't love you altogether? Will that separate you from his love? He said, what about famine, nakedness, perilous sword? What about in the times when you are having to wear rags, when you're used to wearing Armani and American Eagle and can't put on a piece of clothing unless it somehow has some gay designer on it. If you can't do that, what, if, what about if you can't have your 3,000 square foot house? Or what if they take it away when you do have it? Will that cause you to feel like God doesn't? What about when all you can do is eat bread and drink water? When we can't go out to eat every day because we don't want to cook at home? When we're having to put our resources together just so we don't starve? Will that cause you to feel like God's abandoned you or forsaken you? See, these are circumstances that were real in the first century, and they're going to repeat themselves in the 21st century. So will this be the thing? What about peril and sword? And I'm talking about not going to prison and then put to death. I'm talking about what if they show up to your doorstep and right there execute someone for their faith? God, I thought you were going to protect us. I thought you were going to take care of us. Well, saints of God, when you look at Revelation, the 20th chapter, and you see that there are thrones and they that sit upon them, they were beheaded for the witness of God and for the, word, for the word of God and for the witness of Jesus Christ. Don't ever think that's going to cause the love of God to be diminished in your life. Even if they kill somebody you love or even if they were to come and put you in prison. Just know that this is reserving great reward for you in the heavens. That there's coming a day that the great God of heaven and earth is going to come to this planet and he's going to make everything right. He said, so they're writing about us now. They're saying that for your sake, for the sake of the church, the saints are being killed all day. Every day someone's being put to death for the sake of the faith. They're just like sheep to the slaughter. He said, that's what they're writing about us. But he clarifies his stance in the next verse. He said, no. <laughs> he said, no. That's what they're writing about us. But no. In fact, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And you say, how could you say that when you're being put to death, when you're being put in prison, when you're hungry, when you're naked, when you're homeless? Paul said, we're more than conquerors. We're unconquerable because they could take our homes. They could take our clothes. They could starve us out. They could do whatever they want. They can kill us, put us in prison. But what they don't understand that we do understand is there will come a day when the Son of Man will split that eastern sky and he will come down and all of our suffering will be rewarded by his presence. Oh, 
Ah, hallelujah. So kill us, but you can't conquer us. Take our stuff, but you can't conquer us because I have made a decision that I'm going to follow Jesus. No turning back. I'm not going back to the world. You can conquer people that do not fear to lose everything in their life. I know we love to quote that scripture, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of the testimony. And, and in most songs, they stop right there. Most preachers stop right there. But that's not the end of the verse. It says, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Hallelujah. They said, in other words, if we die, we die. Hallelujah. If we live, we live unto the Lord. If we die, we die unto the Lord. So whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Ah, hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. He said, for I am persuaded. And this is where we're going to have to get to. You understand, Paul was fully persuaded. Agrippa was almost persuaded. And we're going to have to figure out where, which side of the fence we stand on today. Am I almost persuaded or am I fully persuaded? But Paul says here, I am persuaded that neither death, whether I'm dead, life, whether I live, I don't care if it's an angel, demon, demonic spirit, principality, I don't care if it's demonic power that reigns over areas, powers. I don't care if it's evil government entities. The things that I'm going through right now are things that I might go through tomorrow. Good God in heaven. He said height, depth. He said nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Oh God, we got to understand something, saints, today. That God has seen that there are things that are out of my control. And the enemy is trying to use those things to usurp my faith till I walk away from the Lord. But I am persuaded, number one, that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. And I am also persuaded that none of them or none of that will cause me to be separated from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus so I believe I'm just going to stay and serve the Lord I believe I'm just going to stay and love the house of God I believe I'm just going to stick around and read his word I believe oh God hallelujah because nothing means nothing So when the enemy again begins to attack you and says, oh, I thought God loved you. If God loved you, why would you be going through this? You just need to look back at him and say, it's going to work out for me. Brother Calvin, it works for me. Amen. These light afflictions, which are but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight and glory. So it works for me, brother. <laughs> Hallelujah. But you're going through some stuff right now. That's all right. It works for me. People are talking about you. It works for me. Hallelujah. People are walking out of your life. It works for me. Your body's sick. It works for me. Come on, somebody. They're talking about you on the job. It works for me. Good God in heaven. The devil's attacking you. It works for me. Demons are tormenting you. It works for me. I know that all things have to work together for my good because I'm called and I love God. Hallelujah. Now, understanding all that and knowing all that, quit being so easily moved. But none of these things moved me. Neither did I count my life so dear to myself that I might finish my course with joy. Hallelujah. Woo! I want to see joy come back to the house of God. 
I'm tired of seeing people walk around with long faces and looking angry don't make you deep. Come on, somebody. Looking like a serial killer doesn't make you look like you walk around with revelation. It is not a sin for you to put a smile on your face. It is not a sin for you to laugh for a merry heart doeth good like medicine. Oh, I thank Jesus for the joy of the Lord because it's been my strength. Oh, hallelujah. So you don't have to walk around looking like you have the weight of the world on you to be sober. Hallelujah. I'm smiling because I'm sober. <laughs> See some of y'all, <laughs> glory to God. Some of y'all that's been dealing with this stuff right here, hallelujah. Some of y'all that have been dealing with that stuff right there. <laughs> and you've allowed chemicals and substance to be your intoxication because you thought you needed this stuff in order to have peace in your mind, but now that God has destroyed that yoke off your life and you realize that really the only real peace you ever had, dear Lord, is in you, the only joy you ever needed was in Jesus, people might look at you and say, you smile too much and you laugh too much, you're silly. You just need to look at them and say, no, I laugh now because I'm sober. I have realized that all I have Never need it. All I ever needed was him. Ah. I think Christians think they need to walk around looking miserable in order for people to take them serious. There are some people that would like to see people have a smile on their face and not have to use a substance to get it there. I've got joy in my soul. I got joy in my soul. God is in control. I got Satan on my trail, but I'm singing all is well. He's attacking every day, but I'm watching while I pray. No matter the attack, I won't turn back. This means war. Listen, war is not always snotting and bawling at an altar. Sometimes war is when you should be depressed and in despair. You have a smile on your face and a laugh in your heart. Come on, somebody. You're letting the devil know I refuse to allow you to dictate the circumstance of my emotions I am satisfied to my, for my stability to be in Jesus <laughs> glory to God so I'm going to smile again I'm going to have some joy in my heart I'm going to laugh again I was in a service one time and, and you all know brother Deloy Smith good God there's only one Deloy Smith in the entire world I love him He's been a wonderful friend to me, and he's really failing. And we're going to have to keep him in our prayers. But some of these men are in in their course. They're coming down to the end of it. And uh, I was in a service one time, and it was just a couple years of knowing him. But he's got kind of a sarcastic personality. <laughs> he reminds me of somebody I know. I won't tell you who it is. But, but he, he was sitting there, and he was talking about the joy of the Lord. And there was a brother sitting right beside me, and he picked on the guy sitting beside me. That was not fair, <laughs> nor was it fun. And he looked back at me and said, brother, you could look a little happier. This brother was sitting there all stoic. I am happy. <laughs> don't you judge me. You don't even know me. He goes, I guess I don't. <laughs> but somewhere along the line, I think God's people got into this idea that sobriety necessitates the look of a serial killer. <laughs> Taking pictures. <laughs> Oh, your God can bring you that ha bring you that much happiness. Mm. Oh, tell me his name again. <laughs> but when they see people walking around with joy in their hearts, you know what? Some of your coworkers may pass completely out if you smiled tomorrow. If you had a little joy in your heart, a little giggle in your spirit, they might sit there and go. 
random drug test. <laughs> but you just need to tell them I'm high on the Holy Ghost. Because there ain't no high like the most high. I got joy like I've never had before. Peace I never knew. Sweet love and joy in heaven too. Because only Jesus can satisfy my soul. I am persuaded that God's going to control everything I can't. But I'm also persuaded that I want to see him. So by the grace of God, I'm going to control everything I can. And everything in my character that is not like him, it's time for me to put that thing to death. Every person in my life that's trying to draw me away from him, by continuing to put temptation as a stumbling block before me. I'm going to walk away from them. Because I refuse to walk away from him. Because I will not walk away from them. I'm not going to keep chasing my past. Christ paid for it so I didn't have to. So me living in guilt is actually a smack in the face to the sacrifice that Jesus made on Calvary. If it's under the blood, it's under the blood. Amen. I don't want to sound like frozen, but let it go. I mean, let it go. Let it go. Get it out of your spirit. I'm not going to keep looking back at what God's trying to make me leave. Don't care how wonderful it was. I'm, I'm, I'm going to share with you today that the most glorious times of the church are yet before us. This last great move of God is going to rock this world to the point that Pentecost, we will look back as a foreshadowing. Like this is just a shadow of what was the reality because he's going to pour his spirit upon all flesh. Our sons and our daughters are going to prophesy. Hallelujah. He's going to pour it out. And John said, I saw a number, which no man can number, coming up out of great church. Can you imagine that? That's the revival, the awakening that is going to happen at the end of the age is there's going to be such a great awakening that it's going to bring a number that not one man could stand there and number by himself. But he said, I saw him come up out of great tribulation, and they washed their robes white in the blood of the Lamb. And we're going to stand there with the 24 elders and the four beasts and the 144,000 Jews sealed out of the 12 tribes of Israel. And we're going to stand before the throne of God and before the Lamb. And we're going to say, holy, holy, Lord God Almighty, the earth is full of your glory. Good God in heaven. So, Lord, I thank you for not letting any of these things or any of those people separate me from your love. And because you've done that for me, I'm going to make sure that the things that are within my control... By your grace, I won't let them separate me from you either because I want to see Jesus. Oh, we're all going to see him, but I want to see him and hear him say, well done. I want to know that I had pleased the Lord. Whew. So nothing means nothing, saints. Don't worry about stuff. Don't worry about people. Nothing means nothing. He said, I won't let it separate you from me. Now, don't you let the things you can control separate you from me. S keep yourself in the love of God. Yeah, hallelujah. And what I'm asking the Lord, and I'll finish this with this. And man, what a day we've had in the house of God. Have we not? It's been wonderful. Praise God. I hate that we're only having one service today. I wish, but God knows. God knows. But I, I want us to understand that we need, as a church, to work as hard as we can to create a safe place for God's people, especially God's little children. Little children should not be an afterthought in the house of God. Jesus said, bid the little children to come. Suffer them. Let them come to me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. And when I see reports of ministers molesting children and all that mess, and I'm telling you, God's just pulling back the covers now. It's going to get worse. It is going to get worse, way worse. 
we can't have that here. And I won't permit it here. Hallelujah. Is fornication wrong? Yes. And that will separate you from the Lord. For no fornicator will go into the kingdom of God. Is adultery wrong? Yes. But there is a difference between sin, between consensual adults, and predatory activity toward children. I'm not going to let it happen here. We are going to work with all of our might to make sure that this is a safe place. God's little children should not be terrorized in the very place that should be safe for them. This should be their harbor of safety. This should be their sanctuary. This should not be a torture chamber for them, and we're not going to have it here. I will not. I told our ministers a couple months ago, I said, if I ever find it out, parents won't have to take you to jail. I'll throw you in my car and take you there myself. We're not going to hide it. We're not going to sweep it under the rug because we want to save face. None of that junk is going to happen here. It's going to get outed, and you're going to jail. Because I want God's children to feel safe here, and I want you to feel safe here. Praise God. Amen. Women are not, are, are, should not be by any men. We shouldn't be coming to church to look at women. We should come to church to worship God. And the same way the other way around. Nobody, this should not be a place. Listen, this is not <laughs> love.com. This is not match.com. This is the house of the living God. And not that God can't allow you to encounter somebody in the house of God that he puts love in your heart and you get married and have a wonderful, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about perversion. That spirit of perversion is not by the grace of God going to work in this church. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I know people now, I mean, it's out there. There's no denying it now. Sit there and just deny. Oh, I just can't believe that. I think there's lies out there. Okay, cool. Whatever you have to say, listen, we're not covering junk up here. We're going to serve God. And we're going to make this a safe place. And children are going to be able to come here. And they're going to love the house of God and have joy in the house of God. They are not going to absolutely be terrorized here and hate to come here because they're afraid of what's going to happen to me next. It's not happening here. I'm not going to be associated with organizations that let it happen. I'm not going to be associated with fellowships that cover the junk up. We're not doing it here. It is time for God's people to be able to pick up once and for all and move on. Amen. Amen. So let's, let's do that, saints. And I want you to help me do that. Amen. I want you to help me do that. Don't, don't allow yourself, because listen, God said everything done in darkness will be brought to light. So don't allow secret activity in your life to become the catalyst that God allows perversion to enter his sanctuary. Get that right and right now. Amen. If it be, if it be overwhelming sexual lust, and all the kids are out of here right now. We're adults. If it's overwhelming sexual lust, Paul used the word concupiscence. That's what that was. If, that, if that's in you, then you come and help let us pray until that's broke off you to where that does not become a stronghold in your life. If it's pornography, come on down. Let's pray. Amen. Listen, I don't care if people come in here and they're leaning toward homosexuality. And the world has taught them they've been born that way. That's all right, cool. They can come and be born again. And we'll see God deliver them and heal them. I'm not going to celebrate effeminate men in our church. Praise God. Amen. And I'm not going to celebrate masculine women in our church. Let us carry ourselves as God has created us. Listen, it is not an evil thing for you to be a woman. My God, there ain't a man alive. Amen. I know that old, uh, what is Bruce Jenner? <laughs> he tried. That's an ugly woman. Praise God. <laughs> I mean, ugly. Deepest voice I ever heard in my entire life. Amen. If you can sit there and look at that and go, that's a woman, you need to come on. We'll have counseling over that. That's a man, baby. <laughs> Glory to God. The world is trying to confuse people with that stuff because it is the clay looking to the potter saying, why have you made me like this? It is good for you to be a woman. There are things about you that men couldn't be even if they tried. That without you, could you imagine a world without that nurturing, sensitive, kind instinct that are in women? 
Imagine a world where men raised children and there were no women there. You think there are wars now. <laughs> God. <laughs> Such a beautiful thing to be a woman. Don't you ever allow the world to make you think because you're not a man, there's something wrong with you as a woman. And they would say, that's not what we're trying to say. It's exactly what they're trying to say. There's something beautiful about that. And brothers should never look at their wives as somehow they have to bear up underneath the weight of a man. For the Bible said the man ought to give honor to the wife as the weaker vessel. In other words, you're a man, and there ain't nothing wrong with you being a man. And if I see men coming around this church talking like this and praise Jesus and thank you, Lord, and walking around in skinny jeans with <laughs> bedazzled shirts on and they're walking with <laughs> praise God, we're going to pray for them. Amen. We're going to cast that spirit right out of him. Thank you, Lord. Because there ain't nothing wrong with you being a man. Walking like a man. Talking like a man. Looking like a man. And there's something wrong when the only thing that attracts women is a man that acts like one. You got a lesbian spirit. Praise God. We need to know that being a woman is a wonderful thing, being a man is a wonderful thing, so that there's not that perversion that comes into the house of God. And so we're going to work on those things because we don't want that stuff here. We want children to be safe. We want you to be safe. We want you to feel like when you come into this house, the only thing we're here to do is worship God and hear from his word. I want you to feel that. I want you to know that in your heart. Amen. This has been a wonderful day in the house of God. So glad to see everybody come out at 3 o'clock. Amen. We'll be back on regular schedule if there's no more snow. I was like, are you serious? I could have been on sandy beaches. Wide sand, saints. Mm, glory to God. And we were going Friday after the morning service. We were going to the beach, and there's white sand everywhere, and the waves coming in, maybe a dolphin or two come on in. And I woke up yesterday and saw snow. I said, oh, Lord, this works for me. Oh, Jesus. I did miss the meeting in Florida. I, a lot of those people are my friends, and we've been good friends, and we've walked with each other for many years now. In fact, this is the first time in 15 years I've not been there, so it was hard for me. It was very difficult for me. Um, but God knew I needed to be here, and I'm good as the will of the Lord. Amen? All right, saints, I don't have a sheet of paper up here, but we want to pray. Um, continue to pray for Gavin. Um, Larry Cox, uh, Sister Jody that comes uh, from time to time. That's her name, right? Did I say that right? My head just went to another place. But it's her father. Uh, of course, we know he's been struggling with his health. We've been praying for him. He fell and broke his hip. And they had to do surgery, I think, today, this morning. And she just sent me a message and said that he has, they have him on a ventilator. And she said, just pray that God will give him strength to come off of it. Man, I tell you what, God saved that man right in the hospital, brought him back to him. It was a miracle. I mean, a beautiful thing. And I got to go pray for him a few weeks ago. Uh, and I told her, you know, we're going to do that again. But he was all broken and praising God and thanking the Lord. So, listen, <laughs> as long as there's breath in the body, there's hope. Don't ever give up on people. Um, so we want to pray for him. Uh, we want to continue to, there was someone else that we need to pray for. We want to continue always to remember Sister Rendy Johnson, my Aunt Barbie. Uh, love to see them here. And Brother Walt Johnson as well. We want to remember him in our prayers. Um, all those that are traveling, listen, guys, this is a pretty scary time. They canceled my flights twice on Thursday and Friday, but they're also canceling flights for people trying to come home from Florida. This is a crazy time we live in. I mean, canceling them. They can't get back home. And so we want to pray for them that God will open up these flights that they can get back home because I tried to go with U.S. Air and Delta, it was $1,200 to $1,700 a ticket. Hannah, I'm telling you the absolute, $1,200 to $1,700 a ticket. Saints, no rental cars, gas going up to $5, $6 a gallon. Whew. So let's pray for them that are traveling, that God will give them, because a lot of these are pastors. They need to get home to their churches. So let's pray that God will give them traveling mercy. Some of them are international. Pray that God gives them traveling mercies to get back to their churches. Amen. The churches need them. So let's pray for that. Brother Jimmy. Okay. All right. 
All right. We want to pray for his Aunt Diana. Also, uh, uh, Sister Sandy Vest, we want to pray for her. She's in real serious shape. Uh, there was somebody else real quick. God, bring it back to my memory. Yeah, my cousin Philip. he sent me a message last night asking me to pray for his father-in-law, uh, his wife's uh, father. He got leukemia, and they had called the family in, and then he messaged me this morning to let me know that he had passed. And so let's keep uh, Jessica is her name. Let's keep her family in our prayers. Who else had their hand up? Brother Chris? Okay. All right. All right. All right. Let's let's pray for your family. A God of comfort, strength and Dear Lord, God help him. Also, there was an American journalist killed, I think, yesterday in Ukraine, and, and the Ukrainians just opened fire on him. On journalists. They're, they're the, not Ukrainians, I'm sorry, the Russians. They're blowing up worship. They're blowing up hospitals. They blew up a maternity ward with women and children in it. Folks, we're in an evil time. I mean, Putin is a total madman. He doesn't care who he kills. We need to pray. God, help these people that are in harm's way. Anyone else? Sister Lindy? Yeah. Oh, I hate to hear that. All right, we'll pray for Danny. Well, God will help you. You know, I there was a young man that was one of my best friends. And he was on pain pills and alcoholic and all that. And he came to the church, and, and the pastor of the church prayed for him. In fact, it was Rita's dad, Brother Williams. He prayed for him. God touched him, saved him that night, filled him with the Holy Ghost. And he went back home and never had a withdrawal. God can do that for us. And if that's not the case, God can keep us through it, all right? And if you need prayer, you get on the phone, all right? You don't suffer alone, you hear me? You don't go through it alone. We'll be here to help you through it, okay? Amen. Yeah, absolutely. Every, all you, you get with your sisters, and if you need, hey, I need, I need somebody to come to church and pray me through, you get a hold of these sisters, and they'll be here to help you pray you through, all right? That's what the body of Christ is for, Shonda. We lift up the hands that hang down, all right? Rochelle? All right, what was his name? Okay, let's pray. Pray for that. Anyone else? This has been an awesome day in the house of God, and I thank God for it. All right, stand to our feet. Amen. Praise God. Wow. What a great day. Brother Justin, would you come dismiss us in a word, brother? Young man, you come on down here right now. He thought he had done it too. Look at that. He had a big old smile on his face like, mm -hmm. Thank you, Sister Michaela. Thank you. Amen. But it's, it was Isaac's birthday two weeks ago. Yeah. But see, we just don't let it go. <laughs> We're like somebody holding a bad grudge. We don't let it go until we deal with it. <laughs> Are you ready? No. Okay. Sister Rita. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Isaac, happy birthday to you, oh happy birthday to you, oh happy birthday to you, may you find Jesus every day of the year. Happy birthday to you, oh happy birthday to you, and the best one you've ever had. All right.
right. <laughs> and he's about to be a married man too, saints. So, hey, man, we'll sing happy birthday and then pray for him. Thank you, Jesus. Brother Calvin said, I'll remember that. <laughs> All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. God, Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, may it keep us, Lord, and Lord, may it lead us this week, God, to, to Lord, stretch towards you, Lord. We got people here. Lord, we thank you and we praise you, God, Lord, that they was delivered today. Lord, that they was healed today. Lord, that they was uplifted today. God, Lord, we pray for them this week. Lord, keep your hand around them. Lord, place that hedge of protection around them. Lord, protect them. Lord, keep our people safe. Lord, we just never fail to give you the praise and glory and honor for all that you do. Be with us now. Keep us safe. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, uh-huh.